Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at Marvel's Eternals, the new Chloe Zhao film that's been making quite the uh, quite the dust up on social media. Uh, 49% it's sitting out on Rotten right now, Andy, which is the worst reviewed Marvel film to date. Uh, we took a look at it. We're going to talk about it, and we'll let you know if it's actually worth your time. And believe it or not, uh, it's... Listen to the review. You might be surprised. Eternals is not Eternals is not that bad. Uh, additionally, uh, we took a look at how do we say this? Titan. Yeah. Titan. Yes. Titan. Uh, Titan. <laughs> yes. Uh, the French film from director Julia uh, Ducourneau. I think. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to mispronounce it. Uh, that's that killed at Con this year. It won the Palme d'Or, which is the the highest award you can win. This is Julia's second film. It is a tremendous piece of. I think psychological horror, it's a couple things, and we're going to talk about it. And that might, might might be in spoiler territory, so it's at the end of the show, because because that movie's something else. Uh, we're going to talk about the state of Star Wars. I know, sounds weird, but it, it'll be fun, uh, due to some news from director Patty Jenkins, former director of Wonder Woman and her project Rogue Squadron. We're going to talk about that in between our reviews, and before we get to all that, we need to get to the news. First things first, Andy, some movie pass news. <laughs> this came up today of all days. Normally we do the show on Tuesdays. This is That's surprise. right. Divine what Intervention. So Movie Pass, the uh, long dead and bankrupt uh, movie subscription service, which launched in 2017 to wi a wild, wild price point of $10 a month for unlimited films. Of course, everyone immediately took advantage of this, and uh, they they did survive for about a year before going bankrupt. But they went from twenty thousand subscribers to three million subscribers in in a year. Uh, it's crazy, and they completely disrupted the the film industry because now yeah. every every film every th film theater has their own subscription service, and they all have kind of different deals, and and they have you know deals that are more reasonable and and sustainable. But they, you know, we wouldn't have subscription services for theaters had MoviePass not come around. Uh, but they have been bought out of bankruptcy by the co-founder, Stacy Spikes, for the low, low price of sub $250,000. Yeah. Uh, Bargain I'm gonna basement. Be, I'm going to be honest. I, I did not subscribe to MoviePass. You didn't either. Um, we both were doing the show before MoviePass happened and then through all of MoviePass and after MoviePass. And if you've listened to Offscript for a long time, we covered all of this. MoviePass was a, a yeah, Andy Andy's underselling it when he says this thing shook up the industry. Our local theaters had signs on their box office windows talking about whether or not they accepted MoviePass. It was nuts. Everybody was talking about this thing. Yeah, the, the balloon from MoviePass was insane. And the idea of being able to go see as many movies as you want for only $10 a month is literally unbeatable. Nobody else could do it. MoviePass is arguably the reason Cinemark now has a monthly subscription package. Uh, the AMC has one, uh, their AMC Stubbs member premium yep. thing. Yeah, that those came after MoviePass. It is stunning what MoviePass did in the industry, but they 100% burned way too bright and way too fast and ballooned too quickly and could not figure out a way to manage their money, <laughs> and they went under. Any idea where this is going now. I, I, I don't think the article really gets into it. Um, Stacy seems really excited uh, to, he, to, to have his company back, but he I, I wants mean, to, he wants to relaunch it um, next yeah. sometime next year and, you know, figure out a way to bring it back to market. He was one of the people who said uh, that the price point was not sustainable because the company um, it entered or was close to um, bankruptcy and it was bought by, HMNY is the uh, oh I can't remember what the it was bought by another company yeah who, who, and they were the ones that had the idea to go down to ten dollars a month and uh, St Stacy Spike said that is not feasible that's not sustainable and he was completely right he was actually fired after he brought up <laughs> yeah. yeah he was canned in 2018 brutal yeah after he brought up these points um, so you know it's it's movie pass has been shuffled around from a couple of ownerships and companies it's gone into bankruptcy now and is being bought out by its original co-founder and it will be back in some form it's like Voldemort. it's coming back yeah um there is a website for those who want to know more uh, i want moviepass.com features uh the new logo which is the same movie pass logo but it's white on black instead of uh, white on red uh and also according to this Mark Wahlberg's production company, Unrealistic Ideas, is currently develop, de developing a documentary on the rise and fall of MoviePass. That's news. So there will be more eventually. And uh, if you want to keep up with the day-to-day -day stuff, keep it here on Offscript for more. Our right, next story, Eternals 
is actually doing pretty solid at the box office, I think, despite some uh, surprising uh, domestic uh, de- or, or say, international developments with where the film's being shown. I think they're doing pretty good. Uh, they they battled their way to a seventy-one million dollar opening, one hundred sixty-one million globally. Um, Andy, that's not nothing, despite like I said that nef- that that nefarious Rotten Tomato score. Yeah, it came in just a little bit under expectations. They were hoping for high seventies, maybe eighty million, and it's still. I mean, seventy-one million is still great in this. I mean, we're still in the pandemic era, um, and it came in just a little bit south of Black Widow. Uh, about twenty million shorter than than Shang Chi, uh, so it's still doing Marvel numbers and Marvel. It's making Marvel money. It's it's not, um, it's it's about where people thought it would be. And, and again, we're in a, we're being introduced to very like C level characters that no one knows. That they're introducing new property that you know they can't lean on Iron Man or Captain America or Spider Man or any of like the you know the home runs characters. They're having to really bring forth new characters and so i uh i think it's done pretty well considering all those things yeah uh i like some of the other box office reads from this weekend uh the princess diana biopic spencer uh is doing pretty okay and a little over like two million dollars that's real art house and i'd like to watch that at some point if not for the show just maybe for myself before the end of the year and uh, additionally wes anderson's the french dispatch saw zero decline from last weekend apparently made two million last weekend and it made two million this weekend imagine if every studio could have numbers like that good for them uh you know good good things i think going on at the box office i i i I look at the numbers for eternals and i wonder if disney is second guessing not putting this stuff on day and date disney plus right because right up till Black Widow, that was the move. And then they stopped doing that, and they seemed to make it clear that like it wasn't particularly profitable, despite the uh, um, lawsuit from from uh, the, the star of Black Widow. I, I, oh, my God. Scarlett Johansson. I think I had a seizure. I'm sorry. Yeah, I lost myself there for a second. Uh, I, I wonder if they look at this and go, man, we could have made a good chunk from people who just wanted to stay home. You know, because we don't really know what their numbers are on the back end. I know they indicated after the Black Widow kind of thing that they weren't really going to do that anymore, at least with their, I think, their live action features. But if they are, we're looking at numbers and deciding maybe in the future they want to pivot that strategy and go back to day and date, I think now would be the time they'd be signing contracts with actors and crew to make that happen. So, you know, maybe in the future that'll come back. I'm hopeful. I like watching stuff at home, but... Yeah, yeah, that's just me. Right. Well, it it seems to hurt the long the long term uh, run of the of the movie and the revenue there. I think that's one of the um, one of the reasons. That's and it's also important to say tomorrow is Disney Plus Day, um, where they're going to be re- releasing a whole slew of content. Shang Chi is going to be available on Disney Plus starting tomorrow, and uh, along with uh, some other surprises and properties. I'm not sure they're they're doing like a whole like promotional thing. It's it's just like. You know, Disney Plus Day, a bunch of new content. Is that also when those IMAX aspect ratios are coming? I think so. I know I know it's we don't really have a headline. I, I probably should have just slipped it in here somewhere, but um that stuff's neat. Yeah. Getting thirteen Marvel films in IMAX format is awesome. You can't get those on Blu-ray. Like that is now the only format in which you can see those in that ratio. So if you want the full frame like effect, you have to go to Disney Plus. Good for them. I I hope I hope more streaming services like release stuff in IMAX aspect. I'd love to see Dark Knight available somewhere like where I could go see it. Like that'd be awesome. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Uh our next story and the last one so, and I, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I did I just have a quick list oh, of yeah. things of things coming out on on Disney Plus tomorrow oh, for oh, Disney oh, Plus Day. Yeah. Uh Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Jungle Cruise, Home Alone, Home Sweet Home Alone, that whatever the that new Home, Home Alone, yeah, yeah. Home Alone remake. Um, some behind the scenes things of that of Marvel stuff, uh, Marvel Disney Plus Day special that that's kind of Enchanted actually comes out. That's that new. Wow. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. So there, there, there's a lot. Um, is that the is that a live action follow up to the? I thought that was coming out later, but uh, according to this, it's tomorrow. So that comes. That's just dropping tomorrow. Maybe. Oh. Oh, so wow. yeah, I mean they're making a, a deal about. We should have done a story about this. So, sorry, I <laughs> just well, muscled well, they, it in you know, there. Technically, we're doing it now, and it's you know it's, That's it's right. candid. Here we are. Yeah, we're figuring this out. That's good. Uh, we watched Shang Chi on the show. God, I don't even remember when we watched it. When it came out, September. We definitely already covered it. <laughs> in fact, our episodes of September to Harpool Review. We did not watch Jungle Cruise. I will want, want to see that there. And uh, I don't know about Home Sweet Home Alone, but hey, good for Disney. I mean, shoot, they're, they're killing it. I, I yeah. hope they keep making good stuff. I do want to catch up on J- Jungle Cruise. I've heard really good things. It's surprisingly better than 
Yeah. I, I, I heard that it was superior to Pirates of the Caribbean. Really? Dude. And Pirates I was like, that's a, that, that's, a, that's a big claim. Yeah. That, that's, dude, that is... Okay, listen. It's that's a bold a claim. huge claim. Pir- Pirates 1 might be like top five best adventure films of all time. It is very... It is... It, dude, you need... Anybody out there who doesn't doesn't know what I'm talking about? I think Pirates is lame because the last like four go go back some time watch Pirates one. That movie's awesome. Yeah, the anyway. first one's solid. <laughs> last story, and this is petty. I I I, I, I may have um, in, incurred engaged this with this a little bit on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Fast and Furious done. Uh, Vin Diesel is asking Dwayne Johnson to return for the se- for the sequel. For Fast and Furious 10, uh, those who may be out of the loop, uh, Vin Diesel is, of course, the star of the Fast and Furious franchise. Uh, and he had a little bit of onset beef with Dwayne The Rock Johnson when he was in Fast 7 and 8, I think, are the ones he was in. Uh, since then, they parted ways, and they've kind of had this infamous, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of rivalry quietly going in the background as far as action movie stars go. But apparently <laughs> on Instagram, Vin Diesel has requested that for Fast 10, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson come on back. I, I got the text here uh, to read it, but Andy, what, what, what do you think here? Initial impressions? I mean, it's just laughable because, yeah, they, they've had this kind of storied feud. And, I mean, Vin, Vin Diesel is, I mean, if he if he didn't have Fast and Furious, he wouldn't have anything. Like, I mean, he's not even <laughs> re- remotely in the same ballpark as as uh, okay. Dwayne Johnson. He's also got Riddick. Riddick's okay. It, it doesn't get the love. But Riddick is, has a cult following, I know. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook along with us, uh, <laughs> I've got the Instagram post up. Let me let me get through this. Uh, Vin Diesel said, quote, uh, My little brother Dwayne, the time has come. The world awaits the finale of Fast 10. As you know, my children refer to you as Uncle Dwayne in, the, in my house. There is not a holiday that goes by that they and you don't send well wishes. But my time, but the time has come. Legacy awaits. I told you years ago that I was going to fulfill my promise to Pablo. I swore that we would reach and manifest the best fast in the finale. That is 10. I say this out of love, but you must show up. Do not leave the franchise idle. You have a very important role to play. Hobbs can't be played by no other. I hope that you <laughs> rise the occasion and fulfill your destiny. Wow. Very heartfelt. He mentions his kid. I don't he's know simping. who Pablo he's simping is. Hard. Dude, he's he's reaching. He's got a pick from the movie of the two of them kind of fighting. He say, he calls him his little brother. Like I, I assume that's kind of like it's supposed to be a bit of a friendly jab, right? Disarming. Um I dude, there's no way Dwayne Johnson comes back for those films, right? There's no way. Uh, reportedly they weren't even like reportedly parts of Fast 8 they weren't even filming together. Like they had stand-ins. They wouldn't be on the same set. I feel I feel like it's a publicity stunt. Like you wouldn't just tweet this out with without a plan. It's true. Like cuz then cuz then you just look like a fool. Yeah. So I I feel like they probably made some backroom deal that no one knows about. He's coming back and they say, "Okay, how do we how do we sell this? How do we, you know, make make you know, playing to the few, play, I, I, it's a PR stunt. Maybe. Uh, uh, Dwayne Johnson has not responded to this. It'd be, it would, certainly would be something if it did. I, I would clearly have, have fallen for it as we are here talking about it on our podcast right now. Uh, post is sitting a little over 2 million likes. Keep it here and off script for more. Who knows? Yeah, maybe The Rock's coming back to the, to the Fast and Furious franchise. That'll be the uh, the kick in the ass those films need. Clearly, they're not making enough money already. Anyway, with all that being said, we're through the news. I think it's time to get down to reviews. I'm excited, Andy. I I, I think, uh, real quick before we get into it, Eternals, yeah, sitting at this funny spot on Rotten gives the impression that it's going to do poorly. And I want to talk about why I think that rating is what it is at the end. Okay. Uh, I think that's probably the best time to get into it. But for now, let's just talk about the film. Uh, so the movie is Marvel's Eternals. So Eternals is a <laughs> comic book tale, as only Marvel could tell it, uh, spans the, the history of humanity. Uh, a, a group of immortal beings called the Eternals uh, that, that have these wonderful powers are, are created and sent to Earth by an all-powerful being named... Amoresh. Arishem. Arishem. I was close. <laughs> uh, I was really close. Uh, Arishem sends uh, all of these Eternals to Earth to watch over and protect humanity from the Deviants, which are this evil uh, kind of race of mutating alien beings, these very animalistic creatures uh, that are on Earth and attacking uh, humans in the very early stages of, of, you know, caveman, Neanderthal, Neolithic age. 
Uh, the Eternals arrive. Uh, they, they dispatch a few deviants and discover that they're going to be on Earth for a very long time. They are meant to be the watchful protectors of it. And over the years, the Eternals uh, defeat deviants and grow with humanity and, and, and sometimes help shape it and sometimes stay back from that and ultimately um, create a, 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 you know, humanity as we know it now. But now in, in, in modern times, uh, something's happened. There, there's been unrest. And the Eternals have to come together from across the world, uh, from all corners of every nation, to reunite and, and, and fight this terrible, terrible bad. Uh, the movie is directed by Chloe Zhao, uh, Academy Award winning director of Nomadland. It is out in theaters right now, not on Disney+. Plus. Uh, Andy, what did you think of Eternals? So there's a lot of things about this movie that work and a lot of things I liked about it. And then it also has some issues that uh, really hurt the film as well. Um, but I think overall I liked it. It it has that that indie look like it has it's been directed by someone who really cares about like character and emotion and seeing like some of this film looks amazing, like the the visual effects and just the framing of shots. It's very, very artistic. So the film looks great. We have good characters. We have very interesting conflict because this group that is uh, kind of supposed to be like a united front eventually kind of has differing uh, kind of a war, internal war of philosophies um, and kind of in infighting. And so we have a very interesting conflict between all our, all our characters. That being said, there's too many characters. <laughs> there's like 10 people to keep <laughs> up with. And that yeah. also leads to another issue in that it's, it's too long. It's like, it's almost two hours and 40 minutes. It's a lot to sit through. And even by the time you get to the end, you like, you just want it to end because you've been in the theater for so long. Like uh, we went to, I went with, with our, our friend Matt and um, we had a half hour of commercials to sit through first of all. So like we were at the theater for three hours. Um, yeah. It was just a lot to, so yeah, overall I liked it. It's got great visuals, great score. Um, it's got some issues as well. Yeah, uh, Eternals, like you said, has a lot of things that work, and I think most of that, if not all of it, is due to the really stellar cast um, and uh, Chloe Zhao's uh, ability as a director. And, and additionally, um, the actual lore, the the actual story of the Eternals, I think, is really actually really charming and and really works. Um, each of these characters uh, has their individual has individual kind of powers. Each one of them has uh, you know a bit of a personality. They're their own people. They're a uniquely diverse cast of individuals, which is very important. Uh, it's the casting director of this film, I forget her name, uh, said that uh, they wanted to make sure they, they pulled people from kind of all corners of, of humanity to represent kind of humanity as a whole, the best of us, um, which is very well accomplished here. Um, they all have, have their own kind of suits, whether they're a different color, even though they're very generic. Uh, they, and they all kind of have their own power. Uh, they, they, one of them kind of shoots these, these balls of light out of his fingers. One of, one of them's really strong. One's really fast, right? One can fly. So, like, they, none of them are any kind of perfect being, but together they're, they're a really fantastic team, a, a la Justice League or, or Avengers, maybe Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, each right. one of them also has the ability to to influence other individuals, right? Some of them can can create this wonderful technology they could give to humanity, or others could, could literally control minds of humans if they want. So they have to kind of live alongside humans, but really stay far away and never touch them. And they find that, like, in some ways, that's just really hard to do. And sometimes they influence humanity in more ways than not. And that stuff is kind of really interesting. Uh, like that that stuff's really neat. Yeah, I was going to mention they also have uh names that are reminiscent of important figures throughout global his yes. history which this is supposed to kind of be it's a little bit of an inside joke like uh angelina jolie plays thena which is a reference to a thena greek god it, there we have icarus we have gilgamesh so th these are you know godlike figures from history and epics ar around the world and that's kind of the, the whole gag is that they've been here throughout all of like modern humanity slowly yeah. influencing right and and they've slipped into like myth and legend and lore right so like when we think of like maybe the greek gods or you know really what we're probably thinking of as eternals like and and the, the people of old you know carved these the, these these etchings of them into the walls and we've perceived them now as oh there's fictional beings but really they're real the whole time like and that's just kind of kind of charming and clever i don't know if that goes all the way back to the comic from jack kirby like way back in the day um but that is really effective writing um and yeah the, the way they each kind of 
work alongside each other is, is is fascinating. Not only in battles are they like using their powers, and one of them will beat somebody up, and one of them will run circles around him. But additionally, like the ways they 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 influence humanity and 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 engage with one another is is good. Like the cast has great chemistry. Uh, Gemma Chan is kind of our lead as Cersei, and she's great. Uh, it looks a lot like Richard Madden is kind of kind of our go to in in the trailer. I yeah, think. yeah. You, you get a lot of him in there as Icarus, and he's a lot of fun. He's definitely kind of the the Eternals think of him as kind of their local leader um, outside of Salma Hayek, who's also kind of the top of the totem pole for them. So a lot of them look up to him. And I think that's part of the reason he's just kind of centralized. Also, he kind of looks like Superman. He's got the laser vision. He can fly. Um, additionally, we got Kit Harrington as Dane, uh, Jeff Chan's character's uh, human uh, uh, boyfriend, who's, who's a little hapless, but very charming. You know, coming right out of Game of Thrones, Kit Harrington's great. Kumal Nanjani appears in the film as Kingo, uh, Brian Tyree Henry, Barry Cohen, Lauren Ridloff, Liam McHugh, uh, Angelina Jolie. Um, lots of characters. Madong Sik, uh, Madong Sik, I don't know how to say his name, but he's great. <laughs> Like a, a very full list. And that's just like our direct Eternals plus plus one, plus a boyfriend. And and that's that's a lot of people. That's a lot yeah, of Yeah, it's like ten people. Spend. Yeah. Um go ahead. Yeah, uh a lot like these are fascinating characters. Like I said, there's just too many of them. Yeah. So it's hard to keep up with everyone. They get along well. You know, they all have similar costumes, even though they're kind of the same color. Um, you know, they, 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 they're at least visually unique. They all have different silhouettes. So like they kind of stand apart from one another. You know, they don't, they don't all look and act the same, which is really important. Um, and they have good chemistry. I, I think the beat for beat writing between them is fun, whether or not they're like battling somebody or hanging out on the ship or, or talking about history, you know, and that stuff's good. But somewhere I think uh, this movie does start to falter a little bit is maybe in kind of just its main plot line. And I'm not sure about this, but I feel like I, I, I'm suffering a bit of, of just superhero kind of fatigue. Um, the kind of main plot, the modern plot of Eternals just feels a little bland to me. It's, 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 it's kind just, of just a save the world plot, right? Yeah, I get, mean, yeah, it's another world, stop the world from ending plot yep. that we've kind of seen a, a lot of in that. And poor people of Earth, man, they've, been, <laughs> they've just been pounded for the last 10 years in the Marvel uh 12 years in the, in the marvel universe like it, it's been rough yeah it's it's funny in a presser right before this came out kit harrington who's in the film said that you know when asked about does this film address the events of like the blip in in marvel history right the where in the avengers infinity war fought half the world's population disappeared for five years does that get addressed at all no i don't i don't even think it's mentioned once in this film and and he said in that interview he said people have to move past that it's like kit we totally hear you but up till this up till that point it, things at least felt maybe kind of a little believable it's but the more outrageous the world of the marvel universe gets like the harder it is to really like feel like there's stakes in it right we, i mean this is their 26th Hero film? It's the twenty sixth time the world almost ended. Yeah, that's a lot, man. Exactly yeah, not. like and and they're kicking off phase four here. So I was hoping there'd be something a little bit more creative. And there's some there's some stabs at that. There's there's a couple characters here who are well, unique, well, and I, I really thought we're going somewhere that didn't. Others that kind of came out of nowhere, you know. So I think the part of the plot that is interesting because because you're right, the generic save the save the world from ending is is kind of boring. The interesting part is this kind of infighting that happens when they they begin to kind of question like their reason for being on Earth. And this it's a really interesting parallel because the larger read of this is like, you know, kind of questioning authority or questioning like zealotry um, because you have people who, well, we're we were sent here on a mission. We're going to stick to that mission. That's what we're doing. And you have another group of people that are like, well, I don't know if that's really the right thing anymore. And we end up the whole the gang breaks up for thousands of years hundreds of years um and then eventually I have to kind of get back together and solve these you know kind of confront these differences in in philosophy that kind of tore them apart in the first place that stuff is really interesting because you get some really good character development you get some really good acting uh Gemma Chan is like acting her face off uh yeah. Barry Keown has some really really great scenes surprisingly um Angelina Jolie not really getting a lot of chance to act she just she looks like she looks good at fighting and yes she's just kind of she has space dementia too and that's like <laughs> that's like kind of it like i i feel like she's it's, a little yeah. she feels a little underutilized but uh, i think she's definitely but she's i think probably gonna do more in future films 
Yeah, her character is uniquely kind of uh, uh, she's she's basically disabled in this in, in in parts of this feature. She's not not really at full strength. Uh, and Andy would call it space dementia. You'll have to watch the movie and find out for yourself. But uh, it yeah, it really it really holds back uh, hard, like really really hinders Angelina Jolie's ability to to put on a, a good performance. And the moments where her character is on. Outside of like battle, right? Because like, okay, yeah, you're fighting CGI monsters, whatever. Like, that's fine. That's you doing your thing. Like the actual moments where she gets to act beat for beat stuff. You know, she gets to, she gets to say a funny line to somebody or say something snarky to somebody else. She's great, but that's like thirty percent, maybe twenty percent of her actual screen time, and it's really a shame. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully, a couple of these characters will will crop up again. It's Marvel, you know. I'm sure, I'm sure, a couple of them might 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 stick out somewhere in future films. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really did like, you know, some of the standout performances here. Chloe Zhao, I think is, is worth mentioning. Like he's a really, really fantastic director. She's young and up and coming, but coming off of Nomadland, uh, you know, Nomadland was a bit, bit of an unconventional film production for, for Nomadland. She was like following around friends and, and literal nomads, uh, in, in like a travel documentary van, uh, with her principal cast, which was, uh, uh Francis McDormand. In this movie, obviously, this is going to be a whole lot more sets. You know, you're probably going to be shooting some stuff on green screen. Uh, but Zhao really takes the opportunity to to kind of travel space and time effectively, and especially the world, um, to get a lot of really great landscapes and a lot of really great sunsets and like lots of really wide lenses. And she she draws from kind of her 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 eye for capturing like the American Midwest from yeah. Nomadland and brings it here. And it's really effective. I think I think the movie's very like really feels great visually. I, I forget the name of the the cinematographer Ben Smith. I think, um, like it, it really comes together to be a full picture, but it's a little long. <laughs> it might right. it might be a little dense. Uh, what what do you think? Andy? You you get a little bit of it's it's a bit of a domino effect because you have a ton of characters, which means you have to develop or you have to develop them all and like. In, get enough story for all of them again you have more main characters like icarus and cersei and then you kind of have smaller and then you got people that don't get very much screen time but camille langiani is great as the uh kind of comic relief and he it's so funny because he like uh very famously got really buff and, and ripped and he like wasn't a big guy you know when he, he was on um what's H, uh, the hbo show i can't Silicon Valley. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, he um, stand up. Yeah, he's always been kind of a scrawny. Yeah, player. and so he got like really big and buff and ripped, and like he doesn't. He, he just, you just kind of see his arms at one point, like poor. That must. I mean, there's. It's got to be edit, editing room floor stuff, right? Like, surely he. There's footage of him on a hard drive somewhere in a scene where he takes his shirt off and somebody <laughs> says something snarky or funny. Because you're right. Like, it's way too much work to just see his arms. Like, I feel like maybe there's a cut scene or something. Maybe in the next next one he'll get get to. Yeah. Do show, show off the, some washboard abs. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Let's but like, sure. like I said, it was it's a domino effect. You have all these characters, so you get, you're trying to develop them all, trying to give them all story, and and that's the, something that most directors would have just cut lots of it. Um, but I feel like she she really tried to involve all the characters in a unique way and have the these real kind of important conflicts. Um, but it is just kind of too much and makes the film very long and very kind of bloated. It gets a little slow in the, in the middle. Like you don't have near as much action as you have in a lot of like things like the winter soldier or, or iron man or some of those other franchises. You don't have quite as much action uh, kind of in the middle of the film. You get a plenty at the end. Yeah. And additionally, I think as, as much as I like the lore, I think that's probably the best parts of the film, kind of the eternals throughout history and how they have, you know, maybe, yeah, left kind of butterfly effects in their wake to influence humanity to where they are now. That stuff's really interesting. Um, but it's a lot of lore. Um, it opens, it opens with a text crawl, and uh, I, I, it opened like it started with on text, and I like audibly groaned in my seat. <laughs> I, 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 I'm gonna be petty here, and I know I shouldn't be petty, um, because because this is a petty thing to say, but this movie is two hours and thirty six minutes, uh, which is roughly around the time of Dune. <laughs> Dune. Did not have a text crawl. They they managed to make that work. Like, and I I I respect that. I know some films open with crawls. Star Wars opens with crawls. I get it. But like, 
the older it's outdated. I get, and the more movies I watch, the more the more I really respect a film that doesn't need it. You don't have to do it, right? Like you can show and not necessarily just tell. And like I I think that's really cool. And and this movie doesn't quite get away with that because there's just a lot. It's a lot of info. You, you know, I had that exact same thought that I was like, this is the same length as Dune, and I was into Dune the entire time. Right. Like, I, I don't mean to, I, like, I, I, it's petty. You can't, you, you, that's apples and oranges. I get it. But, like, Dune is is a property that, like, infamously has been, they, 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 people have said it's unfilmable. You can't do it. People have tried and failed to make this production. You know, Alejandro Hodorowski tried. David Lynch took took a good stab at it, um, but it, this thing's been so long coming. So coming off of a movie like Dune and stepping into Eternals, I know they're not the same. Obviously, they're not the same, but like it just with the runtime and, and considering the release dates, like it's just hard not to draw immediate comparisons. Um, worth mentioning, uh, Denny Villeneuve's last film, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, opened with text crawl. So I'm, he's, he's not above without fault. Everybody's learning, all right. And and Chloe Zhao's <laughs> previous film Everyone's. didn't have a text crawl, so. I, I just, man, when it comes I, to lore heavy features, I've really come to respect like people who can get away with just like, you know, kind of, I, I actually didn't, I didn't mind it so much. The, yeah. the crawl, because it's, it gets a little bit into the weeds of com of comic book. It's very comic book lore, comic booky in the lore. Like there's weird names, weird concepts, planets, universes, and it, it helps to see it in print and to read it. I think you understand a little bit better than if it would have been, um, voiceover. Yeah, I, I I agree. Like that's that's really the challenge. You know, if if you're if you have that much lore, how do you craft it into an interesting narrative? And it's not always possible. Like I, I get that, but um, yeah. So excuse my pettiness. Anyway, uh, overall, I think Eternals is kind of as as a full experience. Right before we get to recommendations, I think like Eternals is is kind of not bad. Like I I know I know we've been sitting here saying, you know, there's there's stuff about it that doesn't work or there's the, the kind of the main plot is lame, but like being such a long feature between the acting and and the visuals and the the parts of the film that do work, I think overall you're not looking at at a very bad feature, which is why it's interesting that it's sitting at a comfortable 49% on Rotten Tomatoes, 48 even maybe now today. Uh Andy, we've talked about this in the show before. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, what does it mean when a movie has a 50% on Rotten? Does that mean it's bad? So again, the way those scores, those it's an aggregator and it just, it tells you how many people did or didn't, in this case, like the critics or whatever. So less than 50% of the critics recommended the film. Um, that's just how it works. It's not a, it's not a quality score. It's just uh, how many people liked its score. And the, is the, and I think the audience score was a, l a little bit higher. So yeah, I just looked. Uh, Forty seven on Rotten Tomatoes right now from critics. Eighty percent audience score, which is pretty good. I mean, that's that's a B. Like that's that's pretty good audience audience score. Yeah, and and usually the, that's what I've thought might have been actually a little bit lower. So see, audiences are are connecting with it and, and are enjoying it. That's right. Uh, some have said uh, it could be. Well, I don't, I don't know what it is. Well, what I think it is, I'll say, and then we'll see what Andy thinks. Um, what I think it is is this movie's a little divisive, and that's that's good, I think, for Marvel films. Uh, this movie does some things that are different. This movie's very diverse. This movie features uh, a, a, a sex scene, which is a first for a Marvel film, maybe a first for, like, a, any... Well, I guess it doesn't really have Disney's name on it proper, but, um, you know, that's surprising. Uh, we've, we've got a pretty prominent... Uh, 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 same-sex couple. I was going to say same-sex couple that are male, uh, which is a big step. Like, usually if it's same-sex, they're both female because, like, in some weird way, society somehow thinks that's cooler. But uh, that's a surprise in this movie. This movie does a lot of things differently, and and I think between everything it's just trying to take a, take a different approach in, it's divisive. And when a movie has a 50 on Rotten, that doesn't mean that it's a middling film. That means people either like it or they don't. And sometimes those are the most exciting features. Like those, that's bold cinema. Like those are the mm -hmm. movies where you're like, man, all my friends hated it, but I, I, I love this flick. And that's good. Like that's good for, for, for Marvel. I think, even though I'm sure they can't make trailers out of it. Cause it says they have 47 on rotten, right now. <laughs> yeah. but you know, I, ultimately that's a good step for, um, their, their brand as a whole. I, I hope they continue to chase down that in some features. I know they'll, they'll make safe ones too, but you know, that that's important. Well, they're yeah, they're also again they're they're not leaning on any of the big hitters. Iron Man, Black Wood, I tried to I'm blanking now. Thor, all all like the main people from Phase One through Three. That they, they are not using any of those people. And you know, in December next month, Spider Man Three uh, comes out, and that's going to be massive. And that's going to be 
all you know playing the hits like it, it's going to be fine yeah. uh but this is not not that so they it's it's a real challenge i think and and like i said i think there's a lot of great things and then i think there's some things that don't work yeah additionally uh the movie may have been review bombed andy did point that out before the show i was like really and you were like yeah but before it even came out it was getting a bunch of negative reviews yeah <laughs> and i was like okay well that that could also be the reason instead of 50 but i don't know i, I guess i guess the reason I say all this is to lead into recommendations because even though it's it's doesn't have a great Rotten Tomato score, I gotta know. Andy, would you recommend Eternals? Overall, yeah, I would especially recommend it to Marvel fans. If you're big into comic book movies and you're a Marvel fan, but boy, you've seen all of them, uh, definitely catch it. It's something different. I think it's it's very it's it's a little bit more artistic in a lot in a lot of ways. It has beautiful scenes, really interesting characters, an interesting kind of inner conflict between them. It's a little generic and it saved the world plot, but that's just kind of comic books in in general uh it is too long i feel and there are too many people to keep up with um if you're not a big marvel fan or a big comic book fan this might not be the film for this might not be the place to jump in i don't i don't know if this is a great jumping in point or or not um i thought it would be because it's kind of you know we're, we're starting a new phase but um again if you're not really big into superheroes you may not be your cup of tea yeah i i i it's a little like how I recommended French Dispatch, right? I was like, if you're a Wes Anderson fan, go for it. If you've never seen a Wes Anderson movie, maybe not for you. And and Eternals is kind of uniquely in that space for me as well. I think I would actually recommend this movie. I didn't think I would. I went in with pretty low expectations. Um, I thought the trailer looked all right. Uh, I, I It just kind of looked flat, and I didn't think a lot of it. And I thought, it's just going to be a superhero story. Who cares? You know? Um, it's actually not that bad. I, I don't know if I'd say recommend, like, save it for streaming. It is a long feature. So if you're already a Marvel fan and you're curious, I'd say go go for it. If you're not, yeah, if you're just looking for something kind of casual to go watch, you may want to wait for this to come home. Uh, and, you, you know, you can watch it comfortably on Disney Plus where you can pause and do laundry in between or whatever. <laughs> um, it's not it's not like a beating. I mean, you, you definitely keep up with what's happening. The, the, the overall plot is, is consistent and keeps your attention. Um, but it just feels a little flat. It, it just kind of feels like we've kind of seen, you know, the world's going to blow up. We have to save it before. So hopefully, hopefully they're able to, to kind of narrow their scope a little bit, rack focus and tell either smaller, more sincere stories or stories that, that take us to new places, right? Stories like uh, the guardians of the galaxy, you know, but new planets, new ideas like that stuff I think is exciting. So with that being said, uh, let's pivot out of this into our middle segment. Andy, while I'm getting these uh, these, these visual elements together, the people on Facebook, uh, what's this segment called? It is time for the death of cinema. Perfect. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we haven't done this segment in, in quite a long time, and this is where we kind of discuss uh, something controversial or just something that's kind of uh, making waves in the film industry. And uh, there's a big story earlier this week that uh, Patty Jenkins' Star Wars movie, Rogue Squadron, uh, was delayed. And uh, this was meant to come out in 20, uh, 2023, uh, December 2023, which would have been four years after Rise of Skywalker, so four years without a Star Wars movie, um, and now it's getting pushed back even farther. So it, it's it's going to be at le least five years. Now there are a couple of other Star Wars film projects in development. Taika Waititi is doing one. Kevin Feige is doing one. Uh, Ryan Johnson was supposed to do a trilogy, but I, they may I feel I have a feeling they may have taken that away from him. Sadly, oh. um, but. Star Wars is kind of in trouble here film wise like th their yeah. sh their shows are doing fine but uh these this property really de depends on a lot like Marvel you need some film tent poles to go off of yeah so so originally this was just kind of slated in our news and we were looking for something in the middle to talk about here and Andy pointed out hey why don't we talk about this one and I said well I don't I don't know if there's a whole lot to talk about and you were like well, we could talk about the state of Star Wars and I was like oh god yeah dude there is a ton to talk about we haven't talked about the state of Star Wars so yeah let's check in for a minute and see what's going on uh right now Star Wars like Andy said has not had a a, a proper was force I mean was was Skywalker the last one Yes. Like pro that was the last release. Oh God. Yeah. So they haven't done one since then. And that was uh, 20. That was two years ago. 2019. And this was slated to be 2023. Yeah. So that would be four years. You're right. Like it, it feels like we're in the middle of it now, but this is when this was supposed to enter production. Uh, Patty Jenkins and friends said this is because of her schedule. They just said, oh, she's going to be too busy. And, and between films, she's not going to have 
She's, she's like two months shy of the time she needs to shoot this yeah. movie. So it's going to have to wait. In Wonder Woman 3. That is worth noting. Um, but I, I think some, from what I was reading from some insider rumors from Hollywood, which are rumors, you know, don't always pay attention. But I, looking at where Star Wars is, it's its studio problem. Like they are having a lot of trouble finding creative direction and getting on the same page about what this thing is supposed to be. And that's a lot of stress. And I get that. Like, right, right. How do you how do you plan what's going to come after uh, Skywalker saga, like the the rise of Skywalker. God, I can never, dude. I can never remember the, the tagline <laughs> for Episode Nine. It's Ray the worst one. It's the most forgettable one. Yes, I, I I lose it every time. Last Jedi is where my brain stops. Sorry, Rise of Skywalker. Yes, Episode Nine. Uh, how do you follow that up after four years? Right, like Star Wars is a flagship property. It should be as big as Marvel, and and it clearly isn't. And I think that's a lot of stress on this feature. But more importantly. They're having a ton of success in t- television. They're having a ton of success in television. They're greenlighting film things that were going to be films into TV series. Obi Wan is getting a television series, and originally that was speculated to be a film. Boba Fett was originally supposed to be a Star Wars story, right? Star Wars, Obi Wan, and Boba mm-hmm. Fett were supposed to be those uh, Star Wars story yeah. movies, like like Rogue One or Solo. That was the idea. Now those are being adapted because of the success of The Mandalorian, which is really exciting. Well, I, th- I think what this points to is that um, a lot of these big properties, like you just need more time than you can be given in a film. And TV is kind of the great place for that. You can do a six to nine episode series and get, you know, six to eight hours of, of a Star Wars property as opposed to two in a film. And some of these, I think, especially some of these classic characters, it it uh, they're just better suited to um, to TV because we want we want so much of them. If anything, I, I think the films might be a better place for to explore new things. Yeah, I like I I think that might be where they need to go. Um, Star Wars has got to grow cinematically; it has to grow, and like they they cannot figure out how to make it happen because they are so bent on keeping it tied to nostalgia. You can be nostalgic and make something new. Guardians of the Galaxy has plenty of throwbacks to like other Marvel properties, but it feels fresh and new and different. That's part of the reason it was so successful. Um, Star Wars needs to be that way. I think that's what a Star Wars story was supposed to be. That's what those movies were. They didn't have a crawl. It was like, oh, it's going to be a different thing. Um, but it didn't work. Like they, they kept leaning on the same tenements, right? You got to have the force. You got to have Jedi. You got to have clone troopers. You got to have, you, you got to have uh, lightsabers. I mean, like, like the, the nostalgia dump, the yeah. nostalgia dump is what is really, I mean, just makes you roll your eyes through half of it. So, I mean, I, I hope that these new properties that are in development and we won't see for several years, I just hope they do new things, introduce new characters, you know, like I, that's all I want in some of these properties, just like, just give me something new, please. Yeah. For God's sake. And they're, they're it's been not 40 years. The right. same, and they're, same characters. Right. And they're not even doing that with like their television series. Like Obi-Wan is exciting for sure, but that's still a legacy character. Same with Andor and Ahsoka, which are two other series that are being lit. Good. The green lit. Good. Like that's definitely a step. Andor's a new character, but we already have got a film about him. Like that's, that's a safe move relatively like Ahsoka kind of the same deal. There's been a ton of fan clamoring for her. She's an infamous character in the television series that ran for a very long time. Like they're just kind of dug in, right? And I don't, I don't know how you get out. I think something like The Mandalorian is a brilliant example of what you could do, and I, I mm-hmm. wish they could kind of pivot that into a film, uh, not The Mandalorian proper, but like the spirit of it, right? Like a, mm-hmm. a wanderer or a unique character who who exists in this universe entirely by the by a set of their own rules. That's a good start, I think. Well, then the other thing that they refuse to do is like you know we get a new Batman every few years. We you know they're going to recast. Iron Man or Captain America or Thor, they're going to pass these mantles on. And Star Wars kind of refuses to do that. Like, I think we, you could really benefit from like a, you know, a, a young Luke Skywalker, get, you know, get a young cast to read, you know, re reprise those roles in as younger, young, whatever, kind of essentially like almost a reboot. Yeah. Um, with those same characters and just kind of like, oh, okay, we're going to start over. We're going to retcon. Bro. And I think, not and only, no one and no they never want to do that despite how much like comic books do that right not not only do i think you're right i think somebody with that logic was in the room when they were putting together force awakens like that was the best stab at this they've made and like it didn't work because they didn't actually have any kind of second or third act to that trilogy they just started with a, with a mystery box and like eh, we'll just throw it away. people will come see it it's fine it's star wars it's great well we got a ray and character and there's this cool guy kylo ren like that was really unique. 
And then it didn't actually end up going anywhere because Ryan Johnson had to figure out how to paddle the freaking boat. Yeah. <laughs> actually have a destination and he did a great job with it. And then by episode nine, it just kind of putters out, you know, like it, it, I think your logic's totally sound. They just need somebody to really take the reins and do it. And I think big, big directors are, are kind of afraid. JJ Abrams is out, right? He wants nothing to do with star Wars. He's yeah. Like, I'm, I'm good, <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, I mean, imagine if there's like, okay, we're going to do another movie that takes place within the, uh, no original trilogy, so we got to recast Luke Skywalker, Leia, Han, Darth Vader. Like we're gonna make it all. I mean, like people would go nuts, but like yeah. th- there's some reason that it's like too sacred to to like go back. Yeah, and that's that's what's so frustrating about thinking about you know um, the the new kind of films they were talking about approaching that, that again they have not even mentioned since. Not only Patty Jenkins making Rogue Squadron coming from one woman, like that's exciting. That's new energy. She's a new director. She's hot. She's bold. That could be cool. Uh, but additionally, Rian Johnson, Ryan Johnson making uh, a new trilogy. Come on. There's something. David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, like taking a new direction. Like, okay. Like we have somebody who's <laughs> taking anymore. a stab at it. Um, but they do. They're just. They're, they got stripped of adver- that. They're going to have to advertise this ga- from the creators of Game of Thrones. And like. They're gonna have no, to- they, got the, they got stripped of their Star Wars movie. Oh, did they? Yeah, after uh, the Game of Thrones debacle. Okay. Well, then, you know, never mind. Uh, but yeah, like somebody like Ryan Johnson would be a really exciting creative to bring into the space and do something bold and new. He clearly showed he can do it in Last Jedi. A lot of people didn't like that, but ultimately it worked. Um, but now he's shooting Knives Out too. <laughs> and th- and <laughs> when, three. <laughs> when are these movies happening? Yeah, like it's 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 just in this weird limbo, and and I don't I don't know where they go from here. Um. It's going to be a while. That's all we know. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of TV. And that's okay. Like, like TV is lower cost to produce. It's safer. It's it's longer. It'll bring subscribers into Disney+. Plus. That's fine. Like, I think I think Star Wars is just going to sit in the sit in the Bakta tank for a while on television <laughs> uh, until it feels enough better, you know, well enough to go out and, and, and tame the the wilds again. But, like, I, I'm just bummed. I'm bummed because Star Wars is... is, is a really it can be a really cinematic experience star wars can be a fantastic adventure you know we can tell great stories in that space and when i you know when i go see a star wars movie i get excited man i got goosebumps watching the crawl for force awakens sitting in my chair like i it's good stuff and and i i I think more of it i hope disney can find a way to think more of it too you know so yep i guess that's it i gotta figure out star wars they got to figure something out. Yeah, they really Because it's, uh, I mean, yeah, you look at Marvel, they're doing three, four films a year. Um, one one year we we had like five, maybe six almost. I mean, and Star Wars should essentially be cranking out. I mean, if they want to really milk the property for, for all the money that it's worth, you got to be cr- cranking out a few movies a year. And we're going to be four or five years without a single Star Wars film. Yeah, it seems like that might be, that might be the case. Um Keep it on off script for more, I guess. Uh, Andy, thank you for bringing up Star Wars as a middle topic. This is actually surprisingly exciting. I, I got I'm fired up over here. Now, what are we talking about? One movie to go. Uh, Andy's going to take the introduction. Andy, I don't. I love you for taking the hard introductions. I don't know why you do this to yourself. This movie is is something else. Um, should we talk just for a second before we jump into it? Is it worth telling people? Spo- I mean, spoiler territory. I feel like if you know anything about this film, you're you're going in warmer than you need to i think you're supposed to go in cold yeah i mean i'm gonna try and try and stay light on the on the plot uh yeah, for sure me too um yeah because like, the trailer like, doesn't at all tell you what the no, film's about yeah the, the trailer gives you tone and andy and i didn't know anything going in we intentionally didn't look it up uh any any review i started to read i would back off the second they said spoilers ahead which is very quickly at the front because everybody seems to agree this this movie is you should probably go in cold. So, so like I said, it won the Palm d'Or con. If you don't want to know more, if you just want to go in fresh, uh, and I don't know if we should recommend early. I don't know. Just that's it. Maybe stop the podcast and come back and keep listening. Anyway, (laughs) sorry. Excuse me, Andy. I respect bold (laughs) cinema. I hope you do too. Andy, take it away. Titan. So that was my very best, uh, attempted French. Uh, this is the latest film from, uh, Julia Durcanal. Uh, who previously directed Raw, which was a big hit, and I think in 2017, uh, kind of a, a high concept horror movie, which I haven't seen, I've been meaning to see, but heard really great things about. Uh, Titan translates as titanium um, in English and uh, stars a young, a young woman named Alexia, played by Agatha uh, Roussel. 
uh, who at the very beginning of the film, she is involved in a car accident and has to has a titanium plate put in her head. That's part of part of where we we get the name of the title. Fast forward 30 years, 20, 30 years. She is uh, an exotic dancer. We meet her at a car show where there's lots of muscle and all these muscle cars and there's people dancing on cars. And this is kind of the world uh, she lives in. Uh, she's very, very attractive. And it's there's a very there's a lot of like sexuality in this movie. Um, yes. Uh, but she <laughs> she kind of has a dark side. Uh, I don't know how much to say, but it does happen within. Uh, she, she's kind of doing a life of crime. Yes. Uh, at the same time good, yeah. as being a dancer. And uh, she has very strained relationship with her family, which is a lot about this movie is about her. Her father's a doctor and she comes from, from you know a wealthy, well-to-do family, but she's kind of estranged from both her mother and and father her life of crime eventually catches up with her and she has to go on the run and she decides to kind of uh, transform herself she sh shaves her head uh, changes her appearance to look more like a man more like a boy and she poses as uh, this child who's who's been abducted and been returned she claims oh i'm this child that disappeared years ago um and kind of goes to, goes to then live with the family as an imposter uh and this i mean this is bizarre and this is like in, <laughs> just it, listening it, to you tell it to me i'm like this sounds so whack and i'm, yeah. I'm going over the beats he's right he, and he's not done yet I, there, there's there's more yeah, yeah yeah well that and that's about where we're where i'll wrap up because that's that's, that's the prim spot. premise yeah. she she the, the the beginning she she's kind of on this this life of crime and then uh she goes goes into hiding posing as someone that that she's not um yeah. the film is, is so much about feel and about this like power and like it's about sexuality and sexual identity i one identity it, itself um there's some kind of i don't even know if, if you call them supernatural uh, elements uh but our, our main character uh is pregnant at at one point which is another issue with with her trying trying to hide out uh a lot of really bizarre things but it's there, there's so much going on in this movie it is really kind of impactful and philosophical but man it's it's a ride it's it's like the craziest thing i've seen all year probably yeah uh this film is is bold cinema for sure <laughs> the yeah. boldest it, it is it is some bold cinema if you've heard this show before and you don't really know what we mean when we say bold cinema go <laughs> maybe go check this movie out maybe not it might not even be for you uh andy great job with that summary actually i, I wanted to throw in a bit of trivia here before we jump into it uh this film has had two summaries provided uh before its premiere at con one is the following sentence Following a series of unexplained crimes, a father is reunited with the son who has been missing for 10 years. That's it. That's, that's what they gave to people at con. That's, that's what you knew what you were, were going in. The other one is the dictionary definition of the word uh, titanium. So <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So, so they, they intentionally have, have positioned this film for you to go in, not knowing a lot. I think, I think that's important. My God, what a ride. <laughs> I cannot. Yeah. I, I oh cannot remember God. the last time I squirmed in my chair or like gritted my teeth while watching a film. It is, it is it, like, I swear I felt ad adrenaline sitting in my seat that something is happening in this movie that genuinely feels transformative. I mean that I, I could not believe how much fun I had watching this movie in the best and worst way. Uh, my God, what a film. <laughs> Like yeah, good, good lord. <laughs> and, and listening to the plot, if you if you got this far, I realize it probably does not sound like that. But let us let us kind of try to try to very. I mean, I, yeah, I got halfway. I got I, why. I got thirty minutes into this, and I was like, "This is insane." I almost and I, I wasn't like, really into it yet. Yeah, I was I was watching it, and and I remember at minute 14, 14 minutes into this movie, I almost sent you a message like, "Hey, dude, huge trigger warning." <laughs> and then I didn't because I thought, no, no, you should just go in cold. Like the colder you go in, the better. I realize I've said this now on the podcast, but like something has happened in this movie that's that's crazy. So so let's let's talk about what it is. Um, God, Andy, where where do we go from here? Oh gosh. So, uh, well, we have her kind of crime spree at the beginning, which uh, we're not going to get into details, but that that these are are very kind of disturbing scenes pretty pretty stark things that, that happen yes. there's like i said there's a lot of sexuality at the, at the very beginning um w when we first meet uh, adult alexia she is uh dancing at a car show on a car 
very pro- provocatively. This ha- we see this happen for like five minutes. It's a long take, and it's yes, it is purposely making you focus on this. It's not just it is yes, it, it's not just that, done that, that. Those camera pulls, they know exactly what they're doing. Yes, like they are very much sexualizing our lead. Yeah, and and it's done for a very specific reason. It's not just there there to be um titillating <laughs> or whatever it's it comes into play later but uh our, our main character alexi has a, a love of automobiles of of cars like she like and again there's this me- and she is part metal herself and there's yeah, seemingly th- coming from this incident when she was a child yeah this car accident yeah uh and and she <coughs> th- sexual that, attraction to cars yeah yeah and i mean the, but but just like the, this thing this whole metal Metal is kind of a theme, weirdly, um, in in the movie as well. We see it uh, pop up in in lots of other um, places. Yeah, our, our lead is is surprisingly. What is, what is her character's name? I want to make sure I get it. Alexia. Alexia. Yeah. yeah, she is shockingly cold, um, starkly cold, um, which is which is unexpected. And she makes series of decisions in this film that really feel like they come out of nowhere. And they they I mean they 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 club the audience over the head. There are, there are things she does in this film that just come so far out of left field. You're like, oh my God. And sometimes that's that's some parts drama. Sometimes that's some parts science fiction. Sometimes that's softcore pornography. Sometimes that's David Cronenberg level body horror. There's some crazy stuff <laughs> that happens yeah. in this wonderful little movie. And it 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 it's really hard to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I mean uh, another instance is um whenever she gets hurt or whenever whenever she bleeds um her blood is black and it's it's like motor it's essentially supposed to be motor oil, oil. like yeah. that like that's the again tying back to the to the car and so there's like it, it seems bizarre and it seems like it's not not really going to make a whole lot of sense but then in the kind of the second or the second kind of like X2 and 3 is, is mostly her being you know kind of being an imposter of of this father who's lost lost their their child and that's a very the the movie really slows down and really kind of backs backs off from the the beginning the beginning is incredibly intense the fiery first act yes which not all the fun is in the open by the way there's there's certainly some fun to be had throughout this feature um the father played by vincent london is actually really interesting Uh, he's a former firefighter fire fire fire, firefighter or he's a current firefighter fire, fire chief uh, he is, um, you know, kind, kind of seems like he had kind of let go of his missing son who's been missing for 10 years. Um, but then through a series of circumstances, believes that he has found him again and, and clearly has to struggle with that emotional weight of, of finding a son um, who may not be who they say they are. Right. Which is horrifying in its own way. Like there's there's a psychological aspect of that that's chilling. Additionally. He's dealing with uh, a wife who he's estranged from and uh, struggling to maintain his strength. He, he's he's uh, participating in, in certain activities to uh, right. try, try, try to take him back to the glory days. It doesn't, doesn't always work. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, part of this movie is about uh, identity. And one of the, the things that kind of is, is studied or looked at is masculinity in different just different aspects. And, and one of the things is he, you know, he feels like or he knows he's not like you know you know he's probably like in his late 40s or 50s and he's not he doesn't have the strength the stamina of like the younger guys he works with or when he's because again he's a firefighter he's kind of the head firefighter and the 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 bunch of group of of like 20 somethings Mm -hmm. um you know so he's really struggling with aging you know get getting old and not being the man he he once was yeah and and, and being you know hyper masculine yeah like that's that's a very important important part of his character um being this kind of fire chief these other character th- this guy that you know the other younger younger guys look up to uh, additionally um you know our, our lead uh, alexia is is hyper feminine at the open of the film i mean the, the, like you said that <laughs> this the sexualization of this character is like not lost on us um and and you kind of get this wonderful like metamorphosis of gender and and the film spends a lot of time on that and i need to rewatch it to really dig into it because on on first shine i think it's hard not to get distracted by some of the more extreme ends of what's going on in this movie um but there's a lot that is to be said here about about gender fluidity uh what it means to be male versus female and and i don't again i don't really understand that there's this fatherhood and, and even aspects of, of uh motherhood in parts of this film um she interestingly does not have a really great relationship with her father 
but it's never really explained. It's all visual. I think, I think a big part of what this movie is doing is it's aiming to hit certain emotional cores without having to bring the logic that comes with that. You don't have to be in a logical universe to feel something when you watch a movie like this. Um, and it hits those emotions really well. Like, again, I, I l- l- physically cringing in my chair in moments and in uh, other moments, like glued to the screen, couldn't look away. Um, even though what I'm watching is like a tumble into Wonderland, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, even though like trying to explain the plot, it sounds insane. Like y- you feel something watching this film and like, that's the kind of bold cinema that we are a hundred percent here for. Right. The, this really interesting examination of, of gender, examination of like sexuality. And it, and it's not, you know, it's not like, oh, like this isn't about toxic masculine masculinity. It's not, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, ta- it's looking at, again, like you said, motherhood, fatherhood, masculinity, yeah, sexuality, femini- attraction, like, yeah, man. femininity, like, yeah, uh, it's, it's incredibly complex and it's told in such a cinematic way in such a vision. Like there's things that like they, that are very met- metaphorical and you're going to be thinking long after the film, like, well, what does that mean? What does that, that represent? And yeah. so it's, it's, a, it's an incredible use of cinema as a visual language. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's an hour and 48 minutes. This is Julia Ducourneau's uh, second feature after Raw. That's it. Um, a stunning for, I mean, second outing, uh, clearly. And, and additionally, it's worth mentioning Vincent London, uh, the man who plays the father in, in this film, definitely has some acting experience. Alexia, our lead played by Agatha Roussel, as far as I know, she was like a, just a talent casting find. She does not have an IMDb history before this film. She did a couple of shorts uh, in, around the production once she was cast, just to, I think, kind of get experience, and those came out before the movie. But this is it, and it is a stunning first outing for an actress. I expect to see her in many more films in the future. She is very good in this movie. Yeah, I mean, she's got to carry a lot of things, a lot of really really difficult scenes. Yeah, I mean, she has to 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 create desire in the audience, and she has to create disgust at, at moments, like really, really really fascinating first role i mean my god I, I i assume she was like a talented actress who's been working in the industry for a couple decades that i just had never heard of um no she has like no experience so wow um andy uh, I, look i don't want to just jump into recommendations but i do worry i'm starting to talk in circles uh should we maybe offer some trigger warnings or any other points you want to talk about before we? oh i mean d- d- definitely some content warnings uh this movie is incredibly violent um Lots of sexuality, Lots of body horror. Yeah, it's very yes. graphic on all, all fronts. Um, there's a lot going on. It's very intense. Uh, and Raw is a similar, I, I think, also similarly a very intense film as yeah. well. So there's there's a lot going on. But man, is it a? And yeah, when we talk about bold cinema, this is it. Yeah, like this. This is this is not only like don't watch with your parents. This is like if you're watching in the living room at night, close the blinds. You don't want the neighbors to see you're watching this film. Um, but it is something too. else. Yeah, it it's it's really something. I I don't know if this will be on Andy's top ten at the end of the year, but I'd really be curious to see where it lands if it is, or maybe if it's an honorable mention. I feel like it might it might be on there for me. But but before we get to that, I gotta know Andy. Would you recommend Titan? I would recommend it to the boldest cinema goer. Uh, yes. fan, fans of the, if you're looking for something out of the ordinary and you're, you're adventurous in your, in your film going and uh, you got a strong stomach, uh, then yeah, the, I would recommend this because there are people that, that I would recommend this to for the average cinema goer. Maybe not. It, it's incredibly intense. There's, I mean, a lot of it is shocking. The first act is just like, it's insane. And yes. it's, it's really shocking. Um, and, and yeah, there are some difficult scenes to watch. Like it's just, um, it's not, not for, if, I mean, if you're looking to go to the, the movies for, for fun and a good, a good time and just sit back and relax, uh, maybe not for you. But, you know, if you're like I said, if you're looking for something new and different and something really in, intense, and you want to see what this French, uh, like way, wave of of really incredible um, female directors, along with uh, uh, Cien, Celine Sayama, who did a Portrait of a Girl on Fire, Portrait really making, in, fire. yeah, Portrait of a Lady on fi- Fire, uh, yeah, really incredible films happening right now with uh, these female French directors. So I would recommend it to some people purveyors of boldest cinema, but uh, maybe not your average film goer. 
quick quick shameless plug just because you happen to mention it um i tweeted about portrait of a lady on fire today i've not thought about that film in months and uh just just this morning somebody tweeted something about uh, uh you know Ho- hollywood will never make like a brokeback mountain but for lesbians because they're they're too chicken shit or something and i was like just tweeted portrait of a lady on fire i know it's not perfect but like that movie's really cool and you should go check out portrait of a lady on fire uh additionally i i would recommend this as well i don't know who to recommend this to man like you <laughs> this is like it's yeah I, I mean it's it's like it's like if you go to buy like it say you walked went to a cigar shop and you're like i want to buy a cigar and they were like sure kid here's some of the starters for you here's some things you might like here's some darker selections and you're like no 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 i want the darkest leaf I want the boldest <laughs> roast. And they're like, you're dirty, dude. That's what you're getting into with this movie. Like <laughs> you need to hold on tight. This is bold cinema kids. Like you, you a lot of people, I, I feel like who might hear this might think of oh, this is cool. You might not be ready for this, but if you are willing to go into the black and try something new and jump into something drastically different, I cannot tell you how much fun watching this movie is. It is, it is like this weird twisted freak show, adrenaline fueled thing. The, the thrill ride that i have not felt in a theater in 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 a long time and I'm, I'm bummed i had to watch it at home my god i can't imagine if we'd gone and seen this in the texas theater and it was running I can't. <laughs> yeah what Jesus. would we even talked about at drinks after i would be like i just want to go home and take a shower like i don't even <laughs> yeah i don't even want to go out um but this movie's really cool like i really respect this i can't wait to see what julia de Cornu does next i want to see these actors more i want to see uh, I've got her name right here, Agatha Russell Moore. Like, man, to ton. So, uh, with that being said, that's our show. Uh, Andy, what are we doing next week? Uh, so we're taking a bit of a break. There's not really any big releases next week, uh, but following up after that, uh, we will be watching Ghostbusters Afterlife, uh, which is on November 19th, uh, which will be in theaters, theaters only. And then also King Richard, the biopic of venus and serena williams father richard williams i guess uh which also comes out on the 19th and that will be in theaters and hbo max yeah uh both solid features i i think i'm a little more excited for king richard than i am for ghostbusters i'm a, i'm a big ghostbusters fan man but like i've seen that trailer so many times since it premiered in like late 2018 or whenever they started advertising like i I just feel like I've seen the whole film. Uh, King Richard on the opposite side of the spectrum. The first teaser I saw for that, I was like, that's lame. Why am I watching the story of Venus and Serena Williams through somebody else? He looks like a has been. And then every trailer I've seen since has just looked better. And I'm actually kind of stoked to see it now. I think it's going to be good stuff. Uh, if you enjoyed the show today, if you like what we're doing here on Off Script, maybe you want to participate, write in, tell us what you think. We love the feedback. We might even read it on the show. Email us at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com. You can comment on Facebook where we live stream the show usually every Tuesday around 4.30 Central. Next week we're off. We will be back on the 23rd of November. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter uh, where I've, I've uniquely found a way to start posting more which is kind of exciting uh, uh, uh through one through one channel or another uh we're on youtube where we throw our live streams up as well for archive we're on itunes google play spotify everywhere you get your usual podcast room on instagram and you can check out our website at offscriptfilmreview.com uh but the biggest way you can get involved with the show if you want to keep up with us or keep up with what we're doing you can just subscribe just subscribe to the show to get new episodes every single week, uh, except for next week, because we're off. You can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram. You can subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Movies are expensive. Podcasts are cheap. So listen to Off Script Film Review, and we'll tell you what's worth watching. Uh, I think that covers everything, yeah? yeah. I think that's yeah. it. It's time for the sign-off. Perfect. From all of us at Off Script, the home of Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching. <laughs>